Hello, everybody. Uh, you may be wondering, Gloria, why are you dressed like that? Um, I love vintage fashion. And on top of that, I love it because it allows you to time travel. So I want you all to come with me to the 60s. We're going to go to a workplace in the 60s, like um, the one in the TV show, Mad Men. Have you seen it? Yes. Wow, that's a lot of yes. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, I remember the first time a friend told me, Gloria, I'm watching this show about an advertising agency in New York, and you're not going to have the stomach to watch it. And I was like, what? It's like, oh my God. The way that they treat women, they're just pretty things uh, who are bringing coffee and typing letters, and they're fair game to seduce. So, you know, there's a lot of that. And I'm like, okay, um, I think I can do this. So it was hard to watch, but nevertheless, I persisted. So in the show, there's, there's many women, most of them secretaries, and the most prominent ones are Peggy and Joan. Peggy is at the beginning in love with her boss, and then she abandons any love interest to become a stellar copywriter and a racing star in the industry. And then there's Joan. She's the highest ranking secretary. She is the office manager and she becomes a, pa a partner in exchange of sexual favors with a client. And then later, she starts her own company. These two women are using very different strategies to grow their careers. And the complexity of their characters show how many challenges and how many limited opportunities women and other minorities had in the 60s. Actually, the show portrays a lot of queer people, but not a lot of people uh, of color. Actually, you have to wait until season five to see the first black employee, and that's Dawn, one of the secretaries. So the show has been criticized for its lack of diversity. But if we think about, well, it's a show in the 60s in Madison Avenue, advertising agency, well, lack of diversity by design, right? So when we think about it from the 21st century, we feel very uncomfortable because you know, we don't do that anymore, right? So imagine that there's a scene where Peggy is having drinks with the other copywriters she's trying to fit in. And one of the copywriters say, oh, Peggy, your body is like a seven out of 10. So then you see how Peggy starts looking, uh, staring at her drink in embarrassment. The screen goes black. The next scene is the shoes of Peggy. And then the camera comes up slowly and there's a muffled voice that is her pitching an idea to clients. And you can tell that people are not listening to what she's saying, people are actually looking at her body. So that was the six scenes, so hard for any women and for women in any industries. Wait, no, no. No, I'm mixing up my memories. I just created this scene from memories from something else. You know, this is something that my friend Lilia told me. She was working for this corporate, um, uh, uh, it was a medical devices company, and she went to Vegas uh, for trainings. Like she was going to be delivering trainings over two or three days. So one of the nights, she is having drinks with her colleagues, and one of the managers says, Lilia, your body is only so and so. I will give you a ten out of a uh, seven out of ten. So, <clears throat> as she was thinking about the trainings that she had to deliver the next day, she could feel her competence and her expertise slowly being faded into the background, and then she started to imagine all her colleagues, you know, producing scorecards like if they were beauty pageant judges, while she was going to be given. Her, her talks and her presentation. So she didn't feel like she belonged there. And actually she left a couple of years after and she became a student at CGU. So the problem is that we in our society cannot dispose of ideas, expertise, knowledge of people 
just because we exclude them or we because we make them feel that they do not belong. In our increasingly specialized world, we need diversity because we need to find talent wherever it is. And we need equity and inclusion to retain that talent so our businesses are sustainable. But at least here in the United States, we have this deep unconscious notion of who are the people who belong in the workplace. And those people are white, cisgender men who look heterosexual, who look privileged, who look Christian and fully able. And people that may look like a combination of that, or we can maybe imagine people that at least behave like that. For example, like me, who right now is trying to behave like a cisgender man without period cramps. <laughs> so this unconscious vision of who belongs in the workplace is what is preventing our success in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you imagine what would happen if we did a training uh, like the ones that we're doing right now in diversity in the 60s in the Mad Men Agency? <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't go well. Well, that's what's happening in a lot of our workplaces in this 21st century because we're still stuck into those ideals uh, from the 60s or earlier. Um, and this is what uh, Jennifer Berdahl calls masculinity contest cultures. This is when a workplace is based on competition, when successful employees are the ones who have a, ta a winner take all mentality, where the ideal worker is defined by toxic masculinity, meaning that the ideal worker is ruthless, never emotional, Never, well, emotional, you can be angry, but not emotional like women are. Uh, <laughs> um, um, never emotional, never tired. Always behaving like a real man. And what happens is that, well, no wonder that women and other people that do not look that part have to lean in, lean out, and beyond leaning in, lead from outside, heal from within, lead while out, be present or use your presence, um, don't be nice, and also rise, and be creative, and uh, be powerful, and be remarkable. Yes, remarkable is what you have to be to do all these things at the same time, backwards and in high heels. Real men are very hard to find. Feeding real men ideals, impossible. It's impossible for men. Men who cannot take time off of their work because they feel that you know, being a caregiver or building a family is not allowed for their idea of the authentic male. Men that have to hide, not being real, hurting inside, but showing outside the real man. The real man that is based on being civil and being respectful to power and authority. We drink the Kool-Aid, we think that this is normal. But cultures that are based on centuries of power are harmful for everybody. We have to do the deep work of transforming our cultures. We have to change these vertical power cultures into circular relational cultures. I want leaders to fast forward to the future. And in order to do so, we need to switch off power to power up connections.
we have to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as something else than a budget line. Leaders of the 21st century, really what they have to do is to change the DNA of the organization, the culture. So we can have cultures where we flourish, we nurture each other, we take care of each other. Do we really want robots in these organizations? Do we want robots that are never tired and never emotional? We have enough right now. Right now. We have ChatGPT, we have Bing, we have DALI. What we need to do is to transform our cultures. So how do we do that? I'm telling you, switch off power. Power up connections. Well, what we need are relational leaders. So um, Fletcher is my favorite scholar. She has spent two years in an IT company in the 90s trying to figure out what was happening there with women leaders. And actually, in the 90s, there were more women in leadership in IT companies than now. What she found was that women who are leaders do a lot of relational practice. And relational practice involves taking empathy and perspective, being vulnerable, managing your own emotions and the emotions of others, trying to get into collaboration instead of competition, focusing on the growth of others. And because they're focused on the growth of others, they don't think about self-interest and self-growth, but they're focused also on the growth of the team and the process of the team and the results of the team. Actually, nobody has looked at the return of investment of these leadership practices because they feel like feminine, domestic, private work. In her research, she found that in that IT company, they would say, mm, no, that's voluntary, that's not necessary. They don't have to do that. All that work gets disappeared because it's care and relationships. And you know, they don't care about that. That's not related to the bottom line. It is related to the bottom line. If you have more engaged employees in your team, if you nurture their well-being, then what happens is that you know, there's less turnover. Their career development is much better, and they don't have health problems, so we pay less in insurance. When you have relational leaders, they are focusing on processes, team processes like trust and cohesion that we actually know that are related to team performance. So that's our return of investment. We're creating social capital. And in an age of AI bots, that's what is left for us. That social capital, the human factor, so we really need to transform that. So again, how do we do that? Well, I told you, you know, relational practices. There's another scholar, Jane Dutton. She talks about high quality connections. And these are the connections that we can create between each other that can infuse that circular energy in our cultures so we can innovate and we can flourish. And how we establish high quality connections well, whenever we have a, an interaction with someone, try to communicate value and worth. Be open to the ideas of the other person. Support the performance of the other person. Focus on the idea of mutuality and not social exchange, but and mutual growth. Focus on empowering the other person to be the best person that they can be. And that way, together, we can deal with setbacks and challenges. So, switch off power to power up connections. Authentic belonging is only going to happen if leaders abandon these toxic dynamics of vertical power and embrace relational practice. And it's not only leaders, it's us as followers as members of organizations and institutions and society. So let's all together time travel to the future 
where we all belong and let's switch of power to power up connections. Thank you so much.